Well, hopefully you've kept your Bible open on that passage, and uh, it's great to have uh, the Bible open in front of you as uh, we, we think about it together. And uh, it, it's somewhat ironic, isn't it, that this evening we have enjoyed a time of communion. We have uh, sat together around the Lord's table. Uh, we have eaten a meal together that in many ways demonstrates our love for each other, our family relationship being brothers and sisters in the Lord, our unity, our oneness in Jesus, the fact that peace exists between us because of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we come to this passage here where James has to say in verse 11, do not speak evil of one another. Or that question there in verse 1, where do wars and fights come from among you? That's somewhat ironic in contrast to what we have just done. And uh, thankfully, I think it's a great contrast to the atmosphere here at this church. It's been such a, a blessing. I've got to know the church a little bit over the last five or six years. But of course, especially over the last few weeks... And just the the thing that has beamed out, perhaps more than anything, is the love and the kindness and the warmth and the togetherness that there so evidently exists amongst the brothers and sisters in faith here. It's it's probably more noticeable than you realize. A family of friends coming up for uh, the weekend for the recognition service, that was the thing that they kept talking about afterwards, Just, just the evident love that there is Uh, that exists uh, between us as a church. And it's something to be so thankful to God for. It is something to praise Him for. It is all of His grace. It is something to be humbled by. And yet it wouldn't take much to wreck it, would it? It wouldn't take much at all to wreck what is here. You remember that this chapter comes on the back of that very helpful but challenging chapter and message that we heard from last week about the tongue. And it wouldn't take much at all, would it? It would only take a few careless words from me or a few careless words from you. Or or it would only take one person or a few people, a group of people, chapter 3 and verse 15, to start allowing devilish, hellish wisdom to shape their attitudes and what they say, and this loving and kind and peaceful, harmonious atmosphere would immediately be shattered and broken and be replaced by the carnage and the conflict that James is talking about here. And so as we give thanks to God for the gift of grace that he has given us, I think, here I pray that this section here in James will help us to guard against a future uh, which is disunited. We need to be watchful, don't we? We need to be careful. Satan is very active. He is a horrible enemy. And one of the things that he loves to do more than anything is to destroy God's peace where he sees it. And so we come to this section now, and we look at verses 1 to 3, and we see the church at war. The church at war. Three times James, the half-brother of Jesus, uses the word war in verses 1 and 2. Twice he uses the word fight or fights. And it's not that he's describing the church's battle with the enemy, with Satan, as Paul would do in Ephesians 6. But rather, he's describing the civil war that is taking place amongst brothers and sisters. uh, The fights that are existing in the church. And it's really important to understand that the picture that James is painting here, though the, the language is very strong and the imagery is very vivid, it's not a hypothetical situation. It's not some imaginary scenario that James is painting for these believers. No, it's a real issue that he is speaking into. And you know as well as I do that it's a real issue for churches up and down this country. You remember in John 17, Jesus prayed that his people would be one, that they might reflect the oneness that exists between the Father and the Son. 
so that the world, as it looks in on the church, the world in all of its brokenness and conflict and division and disunity, as it looks in on the church, it would see something unique and special that doesn't belong to this world that it would see peace and harmony and togetherness and that it will conclude that there must be a God because I've just glimpsed something of heaven on earth. And yet I suspect that as the world looks in on the soap opera of this church here, its only conclusion would have been, well, they're just like us. They're just like us. I remember hearing of a church where at the end of one service, uh, two men who were sitting at the front, without saying a word, they locked eyes on each other, and then they physically started throwing punches at each other. And very soon they were grappling with each other, wrestling each other to the floor, with everyone else watching on and thinking, what on earth is happening? These are two Christian brothers, and they're physically fighting. And yet, you know, we can be exactly the same. Our punches may be verbal. Our wrestling may be through the use of arguments. But the spirit behind it can still be fighting and warfare. Now you say, well, what exactly is going on in this church? Well, it's clear from verse 1 that there were people in the church that wanted certain things. Probably certain things to happen in the church. Things that would make them happy, that would bring them pleasure. Things that would satisfy them and make them content and think, yes, the church is definitely going in the right direction. Now, it doesn't say that the things they wanted were bad things. So it wasn't that they had suggested at the last church meeting that they should steal a minibus. It wasn't, I suspect, that they were wanting bad things. I think actually they were probably wanting good things. And yet the problem was that as chapter 1 and verses 13 to 15 describes, they were not keeping check on their desires. You see that there in verse 2. They were lusting after these things. They were becoming obsessive about them in their hearts. Verse 2, they were coveting them. Paul says in Colossians 3 that coveting is idolatry. I say they were wanting these really good things, and yet they were starting to want these good things too much, and these good things were turning into God things. Maybe you can look back and you can think of something that you wanted to happen within the context of church, and it was something actually that was really good. And yet, looking back now, you recognize that the strength of feeling that you felt about it was totally out of perspective, and you had made it into a God thing. And then when perhaps it didn't happen, it caused this conflict in your heart, and this warfare in your heart, and perhaps maybe that warfare even overspilled into words and into broken relationships with others. And that's exactly what is happening here. And look at the words that James uses here. He's incredibly strong. He says, you lust and do not have. You murder and cover and cannot obtain. You fight and you war. Saying you're a church, but you're murdering each other. Probably not literally, but in your hearts. You remember what Jesus taught about murder in Matthew 5, wishing that someone wasn't around anymore. Life would be so much better if they weren't. Angrily thinking of all the things that you would love to do to that person, how you would give them a piece of your mind, assassinating their characters, murder in the heart. And and it doesn't seem that this is just a kind of one-off spiritual homicide that James is having to deal with, but rather this is an all-out war. But then look at what he says at the end of verse (laughs) 2. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. So why was was God not giving to them these good things? Well, because they were trying to be like the world in how they were 
trying to obtain these good things. So, so how does the world ob- try to obtain things? Well, it fights, it grabs, it snatches, it uses force, it tramples on people, it dominates, it tries to use their force of personality, uh, it, it kills, it puts down, it, it points out the bad in others, it tramples. And yet how in contrast should the Christian obtain things? Well, we learned the wonderful, simple lesson all the way back in chapter 1 and verse 5. All we have to do is simply ask. And that's what James is saying here. You do not have because you do not ask. You haven't prayed to your loving heavenly Father, the giver of good gifts, the one who knows all all that you need and provides for you, you haven't asked. Now you see there in verse 3 that there were some Christians who had asked God to provide what they wanted, yet James says you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Rico Tice in his book called Honest Evangelism, he writes this, He writes that we can turn God into a divine waiter. He is there to deliver our daydream to us. We touch base with him on a Sunday. We put our order in via prayer. We might give him a decent tip in the collection plate. But God is essentially there to give us what we feel we need. These people, they were not asking with God-centered motives saying, Father, I, I feel that This should happen, and this would be a good thing if it happened. And yet, Father, you know best. I entrust it into your hands. No, these people, they were asking God with self-centered motives, simply wanting God to kind of rubber stamp what they felt. And you see how relevant these verses are to you and to me. Because though there is not an all-out war in this church. You know that each of us have the seeds of this in our hearts. Maybe there is someone in your heart that you're in conflict with at the moment. Maybe that conflict has broken out into words and coldness and distance and your heart is not right towards them. Or perhaps they've been preventing you from getting what you want. And Jesus says, Matthew 5 and verse 24, be reconciled to each other. The church at war, it should never be. Secondly, verses 4 to 6, the church and her affair. The church and her affair, I, I, I don't, I'm only getting to, to know you, I, I don't know um, you very well. I don't know your backstories or your histories, so I, I'm, I'm really sorry if this um, next section dredges up painful memories for you. But imagine the pain and the heartbreak you would feel if you found out that your husband or wife was having an affair. And maybe you discovered it by coming across a, a text that was intended for their secret lover. Or perhaps you caught them together. You imagine how it would just it would distort it would just destroy your world. It would rip your world apart. And and what would your immediate reaction be? How would you respond in that situation? Would you would you just be angry? Or would you shout and would you rage at them? Or would tears just flow down your face? Or would you just perhaps simply be asking the question why? What have I done? Am I not good enough for you? Well, look at the accusation that James makes of this church here in verse 4. It's incredibly strong. He's accusing them, and he says, adulterers and adulteresses. Uh, you see what James is saying? He's, he's holding nothing back. He's accusing the church of having an affair. Now, when someone uses that kind of strength of language, the temptation can be to just assume that they are deliberately exaggerating to make a point. But but actually, James is not exaggerating. Uh, In the Old Testament, God is often portrayed as 
of the husband of his people, Isaiah 54, Jeremiah 2. Your maker is your husband, Judah is told in Isaiah 54. You think of books like Hosea and the Song of Songs that tell the story of the greatest uh, love story that there is. You remember how John the Baptist describes Jesus as the bridegroom who's come to win for himself a bride. Uh, You look forward to the, the marriage and the wedding of the lamb as Jesus and the bride, they are brought together and the bride is presented to Jesus and she's faultless and she's spotless. And yet, you know, this selfish and abusive world used to be her lover. This selfish and abusive world used to hold her in his arms and used to harm her and hurt her. And Jesus, he has wonderfully and graciously rescued her from her old lover from the world. And yet here, verse 4, we find that she's gone back to him. You see there, by acting like the self-centered world, she's She's going back to her old flame. She's texting him. She's asking him if they can meet up. She's climbing back into his bed. You see that they're in renewing this old relationship. She's setting herself up again in opposition to the Lord. Saying, I've gone back to him. I've gone back to my old lover. I've gone back to the world. And remember that James here is not describing people who have left the church, who have gone back to their old way of life, who perhaps have turned away from the faith and who say that they are no longer Christians. No, James is describing people within the church who are there at the morning and evening services who are in a home group, or who come to the prayer meetings, who love to sing the hymns uh, with all their emotion and heart, are people who on the surface are very devout, are people who to all intents and appearances are very spiritual. And, and I think probably in your heart of hearts you can You can recognize in yourself something of what James is is getting at here. So you are someone who takes the faith very seriously. And yet you're someone who can feel an issue very strongly. Or strongly disagree with someone's point of view. and, And allow yourself to get really wound up by the issue or by the person. And it festers in your heart and eventually it comes up in a conversation with someone else or it comes out in the conversation with that person and in this unkind way you give vent to your feelings. And as you're doing this it makes you feel really good. It makes you feel really spiritual. You are allowing what's in your heart to come out. You are expressing your commitment to God's cause over this issue. And yet actually what you're doing is though you're dressing up what you say with religious language, what you're doing is you are unkindly dealing with them. And you are putting them down. And actually in your heart of hearts you are killing them off. And what James is saying is, is in that context you have run back to the world. That's how the world behaves. And you've run back to your old lover and you've been unfaithful to Jesus. Look at how it describes the spirit in verse 5. James says, do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Some kinds of jealousy are a a good jealousy. The jealousy of a husband for a wife or the jealousy of a wife for her husband. And they hear that their spouse has been flirting or getting friendly with someone else. Or they hear that someone has been flirting or getting friendly with their spouse. And they're jealous and rightly so. Usually when someone has an affair, they try to keep it secret. They do it. On the slide, they try not to allow anyone to find out. 
So very obviously, they don't invite the person back to the marital home when their spouse is there. Uh, They don't put the picture of the person by their bed where their marriage partner can see them. And yet we see here in verse 5 that that when the Christian has an affair with the world, that's exactly what they're doing. They are inviting the world back to the marriage home. They are putting the picture of the world beside the marriage bed. You see there in verse 5 that it says, the Spirit, He dwells in us. You can't hide your affair from the Spirit. And look at the effect that it has On the spirit, the pain it causes him. James says, do you think that the scripture says in vain the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Look at the jealousy he has for the love you give to another. Uh, Look at the jealousy he has for your well-being and your good. Uh, Look at the jealousy he has for your affection. Look at the jealousy he has for you. And it's a jealousy, and it's a pain that he feels that you see there in verse 8, it affects your relationship with the Lord. It harms your closeness to him. It creates this distance between you. Are you having an affair with the world this evening? Have you run back to the world's arms? Do you find yourself this evening in the arms of your old lover? Are you a conflict with someone? Have words been exchanged that you haven't apologized for? Is there anyone in your heart that you are at distance with and you're unwilling to forgive? Is there someone that you try and avoid? Are you having an affair with the world? Because that's how the world behaves. And James says here, you need to return to the Lord. And yet, of course, the big cliffhanger of a question is, will the Lord have you back? after the way that you've treated him? And the answer, of course, verse 6, wonderfully, is yes. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He gave grace to you when you first asked for mercy. And this evening, if you return back to your true love, he will give more grace as you again ask for forgiveness and ask him to have you back. And so we have thirdly, verses 7 to 12, the church's way of return. How does the church return? How does the unfaithful Christian who's had this spiritual love affair, verse 8, draw near to the Lord so that the Lord will draw near to him? Well, two words gather up verses 7 to 12 for us, and they're found in verse 8, and they both begin with the letter H. You have hands and heart. James says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. He's still not holding back. So this is a call to action. That's why he's using the word hands. He calls them sinners. That's incredibly rare in the New Testament. Normally, Christians are addressed as saints, not sinners. But but here he addresses them as sinners because they're allowing this kind of sin to go on unrestrained and undealt with in their lives. And they need to stop it. They're acting as they're, uh, they're just like sinners. And they need to cleanse their actions. Verse 10, they need to humble themselves in the sight of the Lord. Verse 7, they need to submit to God. Uh, The way in which they've been fighting with each other is the very opposite of God's plan for his people. Uh, And they're going against the Lord. They are in their pride rejecting his plan for them. And James says you need to humble yourself before him. You need to submit to him. You need to stop the way in which you are behaving. 
You see in verses 11 and 12 that this is reinforced. James has to say, stop speaking evil of each other. Uh, That's what I mean by saying cleanse your hands. Stop it. Stop judging each other. It's God's place to judge, not you. It's not for you to sit above the law and say, well, this is right for me, but not that. He's saying stop stop criticizing each other. I remember a woman went to her pastor once and, and shared with him uh, the fact that she thought that God had given her the gift of criticism. And uh, so he, <laughs> he said, okay. He said, well, he said, uh, what I'd encourage you to do is, is do what the man in the parable did who, who also only had one talent. He said, go and bury it. <laughs> and that's what we need to do, don't we? That's what we need to do. We need to bury it. We need to stop it. He also calls them to a change of attitude. He talks there about their hearts. So this is not just to be a cold change in outward behavior, just a turning over of a new leaf, but a change that comes from within. He says to them, verse 8, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Remember chapter 1 and verse Eight, we met the double-minded man there as well. Here, these hearts, their hearts, they're, they're torn between God and the world. They're wanting to hold the hand of the world as well as the hand of God. And, and James has to say to them, you need to cut off that connection with the world. You need to stop holding its hand. Now, this change of heart is seen in verse 9. James calls them to to lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Now you might say, and I have to be honest, this thought has been going through my mind most of the week. It's, It's a bit strong. Lamenting, mourning, weeping. Let me ask you, when was the last time you ever did that in your Christian walk? Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy turned to gloom. It's a bit overdramatic, isn't it? And yet I guess it's not if you've been given a glimpse of the damage that can be caused to brothers and sisters by harsh words and proud spirits. Perhaps you've been part of churches where that's happened and you can understand why James calls these people to lament and mourn and weep. I guess it's not over dramatic if you were given a tiny glimpse of the pain that you've caused the Holy Spirit when you have an affair with the world. Or you think of a spouse who's been unfaithful, they, they've damaged their family really irreparably, uh, they've unspeakably hurt their husband or their wife, and, and then for some reason that they're, they're brought to their senses and, and they've started to see the depths of pain they've caused, and it just breaks them. It, it grieves them. And they've started to realize their sin and their stupid selfishness. And tears start to run down their face, and anguish and horror grips them. and. And if we only had a glimpse of the pain that we can cause God's family and the hurt that we cause God, then I think we will be a lot closer to lamenting and mourning and weeping than we usually are. Well, what if this is you this evening? What if you've come here And on the outside, everything looks fine. You look as you normally do look, but inside you are mourning and weeping and lamenting. Perhaps you have fallen out with someone and it's caused huge amounts of damage and you are so sorry for that. Perhaps you've started to realize the pain that you've brought to the Lord Jesus Christ, your bridegroom, 
in the spiritual affair that you've had. Uh, Perhaps there has been that change in your attitude and in your actions, and yet you just feel so low. Uh, And you feel that this depth of sadness and sorrow is just never going to go away, and you're never going to be reconciled to the Lord. Again, well, James says here, be comforted and be encouraged. Notice verse 7, that when you submit to God, then Satan flees away. And you felt that, haven't you? You've, you've not wanted to um, speak angry words to that person again. Satan has fled away. Notice verse 8, that when you draw near to God, God does draw near to you. It's a promise. It's definite. You may not feel it now, but you will do. God draws near to those who draw near to him. And notice verse 10, that when you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he will lift you up. Isaiah 66 and verse 2 says that it's the sorry and humble heart that God loves. So what was your laughter in verse 9? Well, your laughter was complacent and bitter and unkind. It's the kind of laughter that you have at someone else's expense when you're putting them down behind someone's back. Or when you see them... uh, see some misfortune take hold of them and inside you're laughing. What is the the joy that went along with your laughter? What is that happiness? Well, it was a proud happiness. A happiness at putting them in their place in your heart, if not outwardly. Your laughter, verse 9, was complacent and bitter and unkind. Your happiness was misplaced and proud. And now you are mourning. And yet James assures us here that your mourning shall be comforted. Your painful regret will turn into thankfulness and relief and joy. As you receive afresh God's forgiveness and grace and mercy. And it's with that in mind that we are reminded as we see the theme of judgment and the judge and the law in verses 11 and 12 of how the judge of all the earth, how in the garden of Gethsemane, as he held that bitter cup in his hand, he didn't insist on his own rights. He didn't force his own way, but he said to his father, not my will, but yours be done. And he went to the cross and he died for you. And it's in that grace that you rest this evening. It's that grace that will bring you joy. It's that that, grace that will bring you comfort. It's that grace that will reconcile you to those brothers and sisters that you've fallen out with. And it's that grace that will lift you up.